My name is Paloma Garcia Lopez. I'm the Associate Director of the Institute for Latino Studies, located right in this building until spring break. In March, we'll be moving to Bond Hall. So look for us there in the spring. The Institute for Latino Studies advances the understanding of the fastest growing and youngest population in the United States and in the US Catholic Church. The Institute for Latino Studies strengthens the University of Notre Dame's mission to prepare transformative leaders in all sectors, including uh, various professions, the arts, business, politics, faith, and family leadership positions among Latinos and all members of society. Our vision is to foster a deeper understanding of Latino communities so that we can empower faculty, students, community members, all of us, to make better strategic decisions as to what kind of a country we want to leave for our children and our grandchildren. On behalf of the 29 faculty members on campus that work with us at the Institute for Latino Studies, the staff, our advisory council, and our director, Luis Fraga, who couldn't be here tonight, I want to welcome you all to this special event. Um, we have been working primarily with Professor Ricardo Ramirez, who brought this event to our attention. And uh, Ricardo has been very supportive of our work at the Institute, and likewise, um, our Institute is here to support our faculty and their research. Uh, professor Ramirez is an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame. Since 2011, he's been here. His broad research interests include political behavior, state and local politics, and the politics of race and ethnicity. His latest book was published in 2013, Mobilizing Opportunities, State Context, Mobilization, and the Evolving Latino Electorate. He is the principal investigator of a longitudinal study of gendered career paths among Latinos and Latinas, elected officials since 1990, and co-editor of Transforming Politics, Transforming America, the political and civic incorporation of immigrants in the United States. Professor Ramirez received his bachelor's at UCLA, his master's and PhD at Stanford University, and he has been a fellow at the Institute for Latino Studies and the interim director of, Hesburgh, of the Hesburgh Program in Public Service here at Notre Dame. I want to welcome Professor Ramirez to the stage so he can introduce our guests. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Thank you so much, Paloma. Um, this is the culmination of several months of, of work, uh, but before we get started, I definitely want to thank the, all the staff at the Institute for Latino Studies, um, Paloma, Lali, and, and Maribel, and Lauren. Um, so the staff really helped pull this together, uh, as well as the support for, of our director, Luis uh, Fraga, who definitely wanted to be here but couldn't. Um, but it, it was also, this event is made possible by the coming together of a lot of different sponsors uh, very, through their generous support, including the Institute for Latino Studies, the Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy, uh, the Gallivan uh, Journalism Program, the Hesburgh Program uh, in Public Service, the Snipe Museum, the Political Science uh, de Department, Anthropology Department, English Department, and I think what might be one of the first times we also had some uh, co-sponsors from off campus. So we had the Monterrosa Law Group and Intercambio Express um, come together just because of the nature of what we will be discussing tonight and the historic nature of them even coming together as a panel. So real briefly, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the format. So this, this is more of a conversation. It's not gonna be a panel. I know we've had other uh, panels with multiple people where it's more of a tennis session where you know I ask a question, they answer, and it goes back and forth. This is going to be more of a conversation. So uh, after I provide the intros, I will then uh, pose a broad question that uh, we spoke about uh, uh, earlier in the day. And after that, it's going to be more uh, semi-structured for the Spanish-speaking crowd. It, it, I think it's considered more of a desmadre or a... <laughs> Or uh, like we're just gonna try to keep the structure there, but I, I don't think it'll be there. Un, un, um, un puro pinche party. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's what we'll do. Um, so anyways, let, let me introduce our uh, panelists. So with a career spanning more than 25 years, Lalo Alcaraz is widely recognized as an influential voice of Latinos and immigrants in the United States through his political cartoons, La Cucaracha, 
but also, and some of these are actually upstairs in the, uh, the hallway heading up to the Institute for Latino Studies, and we have a few outside as well. So you get kind of a flavor of the kind of work that he does. Uh, a radio show that he has, with uh, it's called Pocho Hour of Power on KPFK. Uh, both he and Gustavo were producers of uh, uh, Half Like Me, and it's important to know, and, and Lalo was also a um, consultant on the, uh, Pixar's Coco film. It's important to note that La Cucaracha was the first uh, nationally syndicated, politically themed Latino uh, daily comic strip. Uh, he also played a significant role, uh, as I mentioned, on Pixar's Coco, uh, which was awarded a Golden Globe uh, and an Academy Award for Best uh, Animated Feature. And he's currently working on a, a brand new project with uh, Nickelodeon. Gustavo Ariano is the former editor-in-chief of uh, Orange County's Alternative OC Weekly. Um, and the author of a nationally syndicated column, Ask a Mexican. Uh, he was a consultant on Border Town and co-producer uh, of Half Like Me. He is currently the op-ed columnist for the Los Angeles Times. Additionally, his uh, writings have appeared in multiple outlets, including The New Yorker, The Guardian, The Time Magazine, and among uh, many others. Adrian Felix is uh, an assistant professor of ethnic studies at the University of California at Riverside. He just arrived uh, earlier this semester. He previously taught at the University of Santa Cruz, Uni University of California at Santa Cruz. He received his PhD in uh, the in politics and international relations at University of Southern California. His uh, forthcoming book uh, with Oxford University Press is uh, titled "Specters of Belonging: The Political Life Cycle of Mexican Migrants." And that was the, the genesis for this project because that, that project brought everybody together. Uh, the, the image that you see in the flyers that we, that we had throughout campus is actually the cover for, for his book that was um, drawn by uh, Lalo and the foreword to the book is uh, done by Gustavo. Um, uh, it's also important to note that uh, this is not Adrian's first time here. He was previously a uh, participant in the Institute for Latino Studies uh, Young Scholar Symposium here at Notre Dame in 2016. So with that in mind, let me uh, first pose the, the broad question. So we will be talking this, uh, this evening about how you have affected uh, the narratives about Latinos in the United States, but also uh, immigration it's not just how you impact your respective fields. Uh, what I'm interested in, as I ask a lot of uh, the authors that come into my classroom, is what's on the inside? What's the stuff that's not in the bios? That's, you know, what impacted you early on in life that made you want to, you know, you, you had a lot of options of what you could have done. Why Latinos? Why Latino identity? Why immigration? So we will first begin with Adrián, we will follow up with uh, Gustavo, and then uh, we'll then go with Lalo. Well, thank you very much uh, for having us. Um, it really is uh, an honor to be here uh, to share the stage with these gentlemen. Ricardo failed to mention that he was my advisor uh, at USC. He was uh, the chair for my doctoral dissertation, which is the earlier incarnation of this project, which is now coming out as a book uh, at the end of the month. Uh, and as you heard, um, you know, Lalo was gracious enough to, to uh, design the cover art, and Gustavo wrote the foreword to the book. Um, to answer, sorry about the feedback, to answer um, Ricardo's question, um, you know, I think for me, this, this project uh, was, a, was a deeply, intimately personal project from the outset. Uh, and I was fortunate to have an advisor that was supportive of that uh, in, a, in a field like political science. Um, I'm the son of formerly undocumented Mexican migrants from the state of Zacatecas. That's actually another one of the connections here. <laughs> Lalo and Gustavo are also the children of migrants from Zacatecas. Uh, and I was, I was raised, and the profe, <laughs> sort of the borderlands between Zacatecas and Jalisco. Yeah. Um, but he wants to claim Zacatecas because he's on the stage with us right now. So. <laughs> um, I'm global. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so you know, for me, this was, this was really um, uh, an intimately personal project. Um, you know, I, I, as the first person in my family to go to college, I remember you know, sitting in these lar le large lecture halls at UCLA and not really f f seeing my own experience reflected in the material that I was encountering. In fact, oftentimes encountering explicit sort of racist microaggressions. Um, 
uh, and then kind of stumbling upon this academic literature on migration studies, right, Mexican migration studies, and engaging this literature and realizing that there's this whole field of study, um, but also feeling like there was a lot missing from that based on my own sort of experience having been uh, reared transnationally between Los Angeles and my parents' you know, ancestral hometown deep in the heart of North Central Mexico. Um, so, you know, with, with some really great mentorship along the way, uh, I realized that I, you know, I had something to say about this, that I had something to contribute to this, to this debate and this narrative. Um, and that's what sort of set me on the path to sort of uh, graduate school um, and, and further kind of academic research on this, but also the path towards immigrant activism uh, and a commitment to the immigrant struggle, the immigrant rights struggle. Um, and of course, along the way, was inspired by other voices like that of Lalo and Gustavo in their respective fields, right? Uh, in terms of art and activism, <coughs> Lalo's work is now central to my teaching on these issues, right? Uh, the, every course, I incorporate um, the powerful visuals that Lalo has produced over the years, um, literally kind of documenting this history, capt brilliantly capturing this history, the different flashpoints in this ongoing immigration debate through his artwork. And then Gustavo's work, um, you know, just as satirical, just as hard hitting from the, from the vantage point of a journalist, uh, investigative reporter, uh, author of multiple books. Um, you know, um, I, I teach their material uh, extensively in my courses. Uh, and I think that's a way that to, to kind of reach multiple audiences and I think in many ways, um, both Lalo and Gustavo have in some ways kind of a, a similar trajectory towards their, their respective um, uh, contributions to this debate as, as very prominent uh, public intellectuals. Yeah, I, it's interesting. You want to know sort of the story behind the story. And thank yeah. you all for being here, by the way. Um, I guess the best way for me to put it was be, I'm an accidental Mexican. I never sought out to have a career writing about Mexicano anything. And I'm very, you know, I'm very proud of my family. Uh, both my parents were also immigrants from Zacatecas, two completely different trajectories. My mom, she came here as a permanent resident because my grandmother was born in Arizona in a mining town that no longer exists because her family had fled the Mexican <coughs> Revolution. So she came here, quote unquote, legally. My dad, on the other hand, came from, and the, the first time he came here without papers was in the trunk of a Chevy in 1968, crossing the US-Mexico border. So, and then he ended up getting his, his papers because of the Reagan amnesty. So, you know, thank you, Reagan, wherever you are. Um, <laughs> thank you, Reagan. Yeah. Down the air, where? <laughs> he said it, not me. <laughs> um, but, you know, growing up, I grew up in one, probably the most evil place, or well, it used to be the most evil place in the United States, Orange County, California. And so that was a place where, and it's funny because even though it was evil, I, where I grew up, it was all Mexicanos, all, not, not all Mexicanos, like all Latino, all immigrant, really. Even the quote-unquote white kids were Romanian refugees, Polish kids, the quote-unquote black kids were uh, students from our, their parents were from um, Ethiopia, Somalia, Nigeria. Uh, the Asian kids were mostly Hmong, or Hmong and Loatians and all that. So the, the Orange County that was in the mind of Americans for so long wasn't my Orange County. It wasn't until 1999 when the former school uh, a trustee for the school district that I graduated from, the Anaheim Union High School District, he announced that he wanted to sue Mexico for $50 million for educating the children of undocumented immigrants. Now, where he got that $50 million uh, figure from, I have no idea. But up until that point, I really thought I was going to get, I, I wanted to be a director. I wanted to get into Hollywood. Uh, so I thought I was just going to be a director, make my money, live in some nice mansion, and not really have, you know, get a mansion also for my parents and not have to worry about anything. <laughs> but, because I'm a good Mexican son, right? You know, I, I, I got us un jardín so your parents can just spend the rest of their lives taking care of citrus, uh, citrus fruit. <laughs> but um, my parents dream. love to garden, so do I. <laughs> but I remember when that guy said that, it infuriated me. Because even though I was an American citizen, mm -hmm. he still was wanting to go after the children of, Mexi of undocumented Mexican immigrants, which happened to be me. So I actually went to a school board meeting. The first time I had ever even known anything about school boards or whatever, I gave a speech. I still have the speech somewhere. And then from there, that just got me into this idea like, that really opened my eyes. Like, wow, there is discrimination against Mexicans in this country. And I know it seemed very Pollyanna-ish, but it was absolutely true. Again, I, I grew up actually in an area where 
or I, I, my, my Mexican upbringing was one where I got more discriminated against by Mexicanos for being un pocho and by everyone, of course, for being a nerd. Everyone picked on me for being a nerd. <laughs> we but still do it. They still do, of course. You see, that, that's picking on me, so that's me. Microaggression. <laughs> Macro, more like it. <laughs> but, um, but up until then, like, I, you know, I barely knew any of my history because we didn't learn about that history yeah in 1990s Orange County, or even uh, like most of Southern California, but that then set me on the trajectory. The very, very, very long story short about my career, I ended up then writing a lot about uh, specifically Mexicans, but really hidden history. So not just that I do this column, Mask of Mexicans, the satirical column, but I also ended up uh, doing a lot of hidden histories of Orange County, California, <laughs> literally bringing back uh, mujeres, bringing back, um, citrus strikers, bringing back like civil rights heroes, all excavating them from the, from the Orange County narrative. I also ended up doing though a lot of, a lot of uh, history into Mexican food in the United States. So I did a book called Taco USA, How Mexican Food Conquered America, where I try to give voice to all of these pioneers all around the United States. But I would say ultimately my, my, <coughs> like, my, como se dice? my biggest contribution, I guess, to, if you want to call this movement of covering Mexicans, was I ended up becoming the editor of my newspaper, OC Weekly. When I started at the OC Weekly, I was the only person of color. I was literally not just a token Mexican, but the token Central American, the token Muslim, the token Vietnamese, <laughs> the token black person, because there was no one else. By the time I left the OC Weekly last year, we were 50-50. Uh, we, like, we, like, uh, and I was proud of doing that. And more importantly, to be the editor of the, one of the biggest newspapers in Orange County and be a Mexican and like, just normalize Mexican everything, to me, that was probably my, my best contribution to the defeat of Orange County. That's the thing for me. I understand. Like, I'm part of La Lucha. I'll always be part of La Lucha. But my main demon was to defeat Orange County. And I don't know if you've been paying attention to the news, but Orange County is now blue. So I can now retire from that beast. <laughs> now, now I can really pay attention to be a Mexican, right? That's fantastic. Thank you. Oh. Um, well, um, so there's a, I was laughing about microaggressions. I like how, you know, uh, the jargonauts in university, and I realize where I'm sitting, uh, <laughs> like to label things with new labels. But you know what? Microaggressions are, have always been aggressions. I grew up with aggressions because I grew up in San Diego, California, south of Orange County and on the US-Mexico border. And my, my parents, uh, my dad from Zacatecas, my mom from Sinaloa, uh, they, they gravitated to the border my mom moved to Tijuana when her mom died, and um, my mom was 18 years old, and she moved with a sister and had another sister was already there. She was one of the youngest of five sisters. And uh, she lived there uh, and worked there uh, in, in Tijuana and across the border, uh, sin papeles, for 10 years. And um, I think back, to, I mean, you know, of course, like, I'm, I'm you know, s sympathetic to the immigrant cause because, you know, my parents were both immigrants. But I imagine back, like, I had a moment of, a couple of years ago, my mom died about four years ago now, and I had this moment go going over writing her obituary, and which became viral, which uh, uh, was then written up by a genealogy, a uh, uh, Hispanic genealogy journal, right? Which is really crazy because they, they traced a bunch of the, the, her family. Yeah. Uh, and it was fascinating. It opened my eyes and I was like, first of all, I, I learned she lied about her age. Um, <laughs> second, <laughs> my mom was pretty vain. Um, and secondly, you know, it made me think of this 18 year old going to this new situation, because you know the frontera is its own country, and and going and working as an eighteen-year-old. When I was eighteen, I was getting drunk at San Diego State and failing all my classes, right? <laughs> uh, and I, I put it in perspective, you know, like these people, they not only they take care of us, but they they show up. You know, there's this photo on Twitter right now that my uh, my daughter's in college back east, and she sent me a photo. It's, you've probably seen it. It's some farm workers working up in the Central oh. Valley with the backgrounds of the, of fires, the fires that are going on right now. Yeah. And these, yeah. you know, these guys show up every day 
and do their work and to, so that we can eat, so this whole country can eat, right? And, uh, you know, it's no, it's no surprise that California uh, is, you know, it, it's, you know, 40, 50 percent uh, uh, Latino and minority, uh, and it's the fifth largest economy on the planet. And we have, we have pretty good. Don't move there. We're good. <laughs> it's pretty good. You can keep your snow and stuff. <laughs> but uh, we got fires, though. Um, but, <laughs> you don't want earthquakes. But you know, uh, yeah. But so, so I grew up seeing all the aggressions against my parents, who did nothing but show up to work every day and have be, commit the crime of being brown, commit the crime of not having learned English as an adult, and you know, uh, and, and I, 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 I just grew up with a sense of injustice and a bit and anger and big chips on my shoulder all the time. I used to say, I, I have uh, tortilla chips on my shoulder. Uh, I'm so pissed, they turn into tortilla chips. Um, and, the, and, 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 and thinking like, you know, and, and witnessing the, the things that happened to us, getting, you know, profiled, getting discriminated, discriminated against. Uh, and it, 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 combining that with, I have a natural ability in art, it runs in my family actually, and combining that, it, it was just a natural form for me to be inspired by, by that and converting that anger mm -hmm. into something positive and, and always like, uh, you know, my, my mom used to teach me, uh, she used to always, my mom never took shit, you know. She was like, if you said one thing to her, man, she would come back, you know, to you like a, 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 an army of uh, moms. <laughs> uh, and, you know, she would always say, no te dejes, you know, like. No dejes. Don't, don't let in, anybody mess with you, you know, and it implies push back, you know, and that's, that's what I kind of learned reflexively to do. And it's, you know, why not? Our community has been under attack. Uh, we talked about how, uh, you know, we've been prophets for a while. I mean, I, uh, uh, I say I draw my cartoons from the future, you know, because I, uh, me and Gustavo and I, and in my cartoons, you can see, you know, I was saying the stuff that's happening now, I, w I was saying it 25, 30 years ago. It all came true, sadly. And, and it's happening right now in our lifetimes. This thing is happening uh, with, with the people trying, trying to use us, trying to use brown people as an excuse to, to dominate and rule. But, but there's also salvation. Salvation will come. You just, have, you just have to fight for it. You have to fight for it, and you have to all sort of put your own, uh, you know, how do you say, your chip in the, in the battle. Stop putting a come. Catholic spin to everything. I was going to say, you guys are doing it. You're talking about prophets, <laughs> salvation. <laughs> like, you're speaking to the right crowd. So. Seriously, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. But so I, I, I just want to say, you know, I, I, I turned all that negativity into hopefully something uh, positive. Fantastic. But you're saying that there's some anger in your, in your pieces? Just a little. <laughs> Just a little bit. Let me turn a little bit to, um, to Adrian, um, and uh, actually to all of you, but you're the children of immigrants, and the way I see your most recent past for you, Adrian, is that your academic journey is sort of like the uh, immigrants that you're studying. So they're seeking new opportunities, going to a new place. So. You went to the South, to Gainesville, uh, University of Florida. How did Dang. leaving California change your perspective on what you had grown up in? You, you had grown up in, uh, like we were talking about, it's a majority minority state. Uh, you knew a certain community very intimately, but then you step out and you know uh, have to interact uh, with a variety of different students. So t tell me yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, uh, having been raised, born and raised in Los Angeles, I mean, I was, I am as an LA Mexicano as you get. I never left LA, I never wanted to leave LA. I did all of my training there, all of my schooling there. Uh, until I fi finished graduate school, I had to take this postdoc at the University of Florida. So here was this, you know, Mexican, you know, recent, newly minted PhD in the Deep South, uh, teaching classes on Latino politics, teaching classes on immigration politics. Um, and you know, pedagogically, I, I, I grew so much out of that experience because, you know, being in that particular uh, location 
um, radically expanded my horizon, my understanding of Latinidad, of Latinoness, and the Latino experience. You know, it's one thing to kind of uh, be trained uh, and, and to read uh, these different kind of experiences, the, the Afro-Caribbean experience, for example. It was another thing to be there teaching, working with Cuban-American youth from Miami, working with Dominican youth, Puerto Rican students, et cetera. Um, so I think it really kind of, um, you know, pedagogically deepened and expanded my understanding of Latino, Latinidad and Latino struggle. Um, even though I focus on the Mexico-US case or experience, I, I've always sort of uh, approached that topic very in a very comparative you know, fashion. Um, learned a lot from the, for, for instance, the Caribbean experience. Um, and, I, and I've taken that with me, right? Now that I'm back in California, I was teaching at UC Santa Cruz, now I'm at UC Riverside. Um, you know, my, my teaching, even my writing on these issues um, uh, was deeply, radically Im influenced by that. Um, every location that I've been in you know, has its own kind of racial history, has its own localized racial regime. And I think that has only further enriched my understanding of the migrant struggle writ, writ large. Okay, you mentioned the, this notion of Latinidad. Uh, my question to all of you is, what about the, you know, we, we talk about Latinos as if they're one group, uh, but you know, there is a more heterogeneous experience, but not just that, there's internal tensions within our communities. Yeah. So talk to me about the, those internal tensions and what that's done within your fields. And it's opposed to any of you. Where should we start? Yeah, that's, that's just, <laughs> no. Well, it, in my column, I'll I'll talk specifically about my Ask a Mexican column. So, the, if you had never heard of it, it, the premise is very simple. People would send me questions about Mexicans, and I would answer them. And the purpose of the column was to debunk and deconstruct stereotypes and misconceptions that people had about Mexicans. And it wasn't all just, I, I would categorize them as innocently ignorant and then blatantly ignorant. So if someone asks you, hey, like, why does a lot of Mexican music sound like Oktoberfest, like the umpa and the tuba? <laughs> that's not a racist question. Mexicans want to know the answer. The answer to that is very simple. German immigrants, Bavarians, uh, you know, German Catholics went down to Sinaloa in the turn of the 20th century, brought their traditions with them. Germans and Czechs, they also brought all those wonderful Mexican beers that you're supposed to be drinking all the time. Uh, they're all German, they're all Pilsners and all that. So I would also get questions from Mexicans about, so that's the innocently ignorant, then there's the blatantly ignorant. So because it was my column, I would get questions. I would get questions from Mexicans talking trash on pick whatever ethnic group you want or pick whatever Mexican group. Oh, why are people from Guadalajara so uh, stuck up, you know, from uh, the state of Jalisco? Why are Mexican uh, Chilangos, people from Mexico City, why are they always so dirty? Why are this, <laughs> this, and that? Stereotypes. These are stereotypes that Mexicans are asking about themselves. So for myself, the point that I always try to make in my column, like, if, if I got a question from a racist white person, oh yeah, I'd hit them. If I got a question from a racist Mexican person, I would keep punching them and said, don't you get it? We're not supposed to do this. We were supposed to be better than this and you're proving that we're not better than this. In some ways you're proving that we're neither sinners nor saints, we're just human beings, but they're always gonna be that tension. That, you know, especially on, you know, in so I'm not gonna speak to the experience here in Indiana because I don't know it, but I know in Southern California, there's always been historical tensions. Just take your pick. Mexicans versus Salvadorans. Mexicans versus African Americans. Mexicans versus white people, Mexicans versus Asian Americans. There, that's actually been a big fight in the political scene in Orange County, the tension between Vietnamese Americans and Mexican Americans and how the Republican Party is using both of them. So I think though we have to address those, we have to criticize our own in-group when we do stupid things. We haven't even talked about homophobia among our community. We haven't like, or what's going on right now with the caravans of Central Americans are going through Mexico. We were talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. Here come these viral videos of Mexicans saying, oh, look at these Central Americans. They're like leaving everything all dirty and they're an invading army and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's the same thing that white folks in the United States say about Mexicans, yet we cry racism when it's done to us, yet we do the same. At that point, we don't deserve any sympathy whatsoever. Yeah. Well, there's there's idiots in every country, so. Yes, <laughs> right. That's that's my point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what about in as you try to advance in your own uh, career to try to create a voice? How did the internal tensions of well, you don't really represent the the real Chicano point of view, Lalo. It's like you just have your own San Diego version of you know uh, or Zacatecano. Uh, or nobody's ever told me that, but I, if I had a dollar for every time. An older Chicano told me, 
Hey, you're a payaso. Because <laughs> they don't get satire. Translate. You know, a payaso, clown, clown you yeah, know. Yeah. And uh, they, you know, because because uh, we have, I always joke that, uh, uh, you know, Mexican-Americans and Latinos, you know, even though we have, especially Mexicans, have a deep tradition of satire uh, in, from in Mexico, once we cross the border, man, we get irony deficiency, and we suddenly do not understand <laughs> complex jokes and satire and things, and, and, and it's like, I mean, I've, I've, have, I've had to field lots of hate mail about you know, people completely misunderstanding my, my jokes and my com comics. I've had to go to a high school in LA to calm the students down because uh, two students were campaigning against my, my, my comic in the LA Weekly because they didn't understand that I was being satirical. And if I use you know, a, a, a negative image or portrayal or an archetype, mm -hmm. it's it, for the service of this greater point. You know? And uh, it, it was, it's, it's been a lifelong disappointment in my community <laughs> that, uh, and I'm sure they would say the same thing about me, uh, that uh, a lot of people just did not get satire. It's funny because you go, go to Mexico, uh, uh, oh, you know, like when we did Border Town, we did a show on Fox called Border mm -hmm. Town, which was like uh, kind of like Chicano politics, border politics meets family guy, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it had its good points, it had its like dick jokes, you know? And so it was like, it, was, it, it lasted a season. Um, and uh, I, I already forgot what I was going to say about uh, the, uh, the oh, forget it. Um, the, 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 which joke? The, 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 yeah, anyway, yeah, I got lots of, uh, you know, we got lots of pushback from younger college students that didn't get um, satire. And uh, I had to explain, like, you know, in Mexico, all people, you know, the, 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 the college student was saying, like, how can you laugh at our community or uh, at immigration? You know, aren't you from the border? Why are you? That's all we do is laugh about immigration. That's all we do. In Mexico, people sit around and laugh at your, their terrible lives. You know, that's how you cope. I mean, it is a, it's the national sport. Isn't, isn't that what Freud said about humor? I mean, it's all a coping mechanism. Whenever you have anything bad, you, it's gallows humor. Anytime there's something, especially in Mexican uh, you know, in Mexican tradition, you have been, who was the greatest comic of them all? Cantin. Cantinflas. What did he make jokes about? The, los pelados, the poorest of the poor. They were able to find humor in very sad situations. Like with the border, um, you know, the best, uh, the best ever critique of the border wall, in my opinion, is by, uh, uh, como se dice, was el tri. Like, uh, you know, this is like rock en español, but old, grizzled, whatever. It's called el muro de la, venga de la vergüenza, the, the, the border wall of shame. I'm not going to translate the lyrics, but let's just say it gets very scatological very, very fast. And it's a hilarious song. It really is. Look it up, El Muro de la Vergüenza. Maybe we could play it later. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'll stream it Everybody's on Everybody's on their, their phone right yeah, now yeah. Uh, <laughs> looking it up. So, I mean, clearly identity is important to you and, and in terms of what you've done, why? But even more important, why do you think that there are those in our community for whom, like, why are you focusing on identity? Why can't we just be Americans? Why can't you just, you know? Oh. And, and, I mean, we hear this in, in academia, right? Why are you studying, you know, why don't you just focus on American politics? Uh, how would you answer that? That's right. Well, I mean, I think, I think we went from this kind of moment of denial and this kind of short-lived post-racial moment, right, where now we, we can't sort of retreat from the question of racial and ethnic identity, right? We're at a moment where these issues have come back to haunt us um, uh, at a national scale, right? The, the, everything that Lalo and Gustavo have been saying for a long time uh, are now, we're now witnessing that uh, at a national level under the current administration, the current political climate. Um, so I think a lot of it um, has to do with that, you know, how people have dealt with these legacies of, of, of racism and shame and so forth. But I think now more than ever, it's important to have these debates and these discussions. Um, and you know, that's a, it's not an easy thing, right? You were talking about kind of intra-ethnic tensions and brown on brown hate. I mean, look no further for these examples, right? I, these guys probably get more hate from fellow Latinos than any other critic, critics uh, out there, right? Everything ranging from like their vendidos, sellouts to, and you know, there's, an, 
there's an important argument to be made about cultural appropriation and so forth. But for me, um, it was important to bring those voices together, right? Um, as I was working on this project, I thought, you know, how can I sort of have their imprint, right? Uh, and, and, and have this conversation. Because uh, regardless of the critiques, um, as important as some of them may be, these are important you know, public intellectuals, impor important voices of debate. And I think um, they've been shedding a light on all the internal contradictions of this thing we call Latino identity for, for a very long time. It always cracks me up when people say, oh, well, why don't you focus on being American? Of course, it's implied that when we're here, we're quote unquote American, whatever they may be. Frankly, I, I believe when people say that, it betrays an insecurity on what they feel is an American because they obviously don't feel that Latino is an American. Mm -hmm. it, like the, the great question of ethnic studies. Oh yeah, thanks, cool, thank you. No, <laughs> it, it, it gets, I, I, so I, for the LA Times, my column is about just the state of California. So uh, just whatever's going on. So I had a column uh, uh, pegged to the 50th anniversary of the Chicano Studies program at Cal State LA, the oldest Chicano Studies program in the United States. And I, in, I you know, it's easy to ridicule uh, ethnic studies. Oh, you're teaching pe students to be angry and to be bitter and to not like the American experience. But what are we talking about when we're talking about ethnic studies? We're talking about stuff that happened in the United States. This is <laughs> American history, American sociology. American this. It just so happened that the arbiters of history in the past were a bunch of racist white guys who didn't think that was important, who didn't think, oh yeah, you know, Mendes at all versus Westminster at all, that's not history. Oh yeah, you know, Harriet Tubman, nah, she's not important, all of that. Now we're, in, and frankly, ethnic studies to me is adult history. American history of the past, that's juvenile history. You know how you tell kids certain things because they, they you know, they could only absorb so much. That's what American history was in the past. Ethnic studies is the full damn truth. If, whether you like it or not, if you don't like it, then you're just a kid. A, like Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, you know. Simple. simple and then simple. you know, uh, how many yes. how many natives uh, did he kill? You know, like I mean, it's all not. Uh, you put it perfectly. It's the the baby version of mm -hmm. uh, history it's versus American. the actual version. You know, it's not a version. It's what actually happened. So I mean, you you've talked about how you've been sort of prophesizing what's going to happen. And you had a character, was it was uh, Ben Deportado? Or what, uh, Daniel, Daniel, Daniel Deportado, Deportado, right? So let's have Daniel Deportado, if you can explain <laughs> who he is a little bit, talking to the, the response from Ask a Mexican, you know? Because I see those as sort of uh, on, on two different sides. In back in, okay, so we're saying how we are living this like national kind of replay of what we experienced in, in Southern California. It, back in the uh, early 94. 90s, it was Proposition uh, 187, the Save Our State Initiative, which was the granddaddy of some of these modern day uh, laws and attitudes that they tried to put. I mean, up to last weekend, the caravan uh, propaganda. And the, 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 a few days before that, maybe 48 hours before that, Birthright citizenship, you know, and these are things that I, I'm I'm familiar with. You know, uh, I knew that someday um, Republicans were, or, or uh, I'm not sure if Trump is a Republican or not, but so people in the Repu Republican Party were going to try to bring that up as a national thing, where you know, to deny the citizenship uh, to the children of immigrants, regardless of status. I think is where it was going because we heard that propaganda talking points back in the early 90s. And it was this, um, um, uh, you know, we had the Minutemen, we had Light Up the Border, we had all these crazy, you know, kind of like white supremacist, um, you know, overweight militia guys that would like come, they hated Mexicans, they did all these things, and then, you know, later they would go retire to Baja with their Mexican wives, right? Yeah. Uh, and, but anyway, that's a whole nother story. But uh, so, this, this propaganda, this ideology was so crazy, and it was getting so insane, the dogma around the, the, the 1993, 1994, that um, I, 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 I used to do a, a, a zine with a friend of mine. It was called Pocho Magazine. And so we, we would write this crazy satire. And uh, one day, I just had such a stomach ache. Like, I was getting an ulcer from all the, the racial hatred stuff, the propaganda against Mexicans. 
One day I remember I was, I, I was, in, my, uh, I was in my Volkswagen Bug I used to tool around in, and uh, I turned to my friend uh, Esteban, and I'm like, you know, I can't stand this anymore, man. What, what, why don't we do something like totally, total, totally crazy? Let's start, because uh, um, uh, the governor was Pete Wilson, mm -hmm. and he was using, like Trump is using the, the, the brown immigrant to scare the you, the caravans. Yeah. I mean, the commercial uh, that they were uh, running, right? They yeah, his, that, that they, actual They keep you know, coming with this ominous voice. Yeah, yeah, every Honduran baby is a, you know, MS-13 trainee, right? And they're bringing so, smallpox. They're bringing, the, yeah. Yeah, they're bringing it back yeah. from yeah. Uh, being cured, right? <laughs> uh, and so anyway, the, it was getting so ridiculous. Pete Wilson had created a group called Latinos for Wilson, mm -hmm. which was his fake support group. Turns out it was three Cuban-American attorneys you know, that just took some money to be his support group. And they were from Miami. They weren't even from uh, California. He was running for governor. And I said, let's start our own group. Hispanics for Wilson. <laughs> and let's make it a group so rabidly anti-immigrant and self-hating that, that people won't even you know, get the, the joke that, it, that we're mocking this hate. And it's, this is the way that I deal with all this crazy stuff and just mock it, right? And so uh, we, we sent out a fake press release. Uh, and I was the leader of the group. I was Daniel Deportado. I was the president of the group. Daniel D. Daniel and then D Portado. Portado yeah, right? yeah. And, and, yeah. and I was undocumented, right? And, uh, and then, um, and then my, my, my partner ended up being uh, Joe, no, not Joe Bacatare. I forget his, uh, his name. Bacatare is stupid in Japanese, but that was another thing. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we ended up, to make a long story short, we, people believed this press release and newspapers started calling us and trying to interview us. And then <laughs> Telemundo called and said, would you like to be on a TV show, uh, the Sev Sec show? And, I, and uh, Sev Sec was the producer for Christina. Do you remember Christina, the show? Like, yeah. You know, que es mejor, gay o homosexual? You know, it was there like, it had these like insane topics. Uh, and so we went on TV uh, as, as uh, they, they asked us to come on uh, as his, uh, Hispanics for Wilson, and we were in a, a studio audience, live L LA, Miami uh, uh, a satellite feed, first one ever for that show. The Latinos for Wilson guys were in Miami the, with, a, with a bunch of UCLA uh, act, uh, immigration oh. activists who saw us through the monitors going like, that's Lalo, you know? <laughs> And I know that other guy, I know that, like, what's going on? Yeah, right? I remember. And so, remember. like, they didn't yeah. say anything, but we, the, the audience was a group of high school students from, I think, Riverside wow. that had gotten expelled or suspended for walking out and protesting 187, you know? And so, so they wanted to lynch us, you know? They wanted to seriously kill us in the parking lot. And I had this little homie, like a little 10th grader, who was there next to me, and he was, and I was dressed up like a narc cop from the '70s TV show, you know, and uh, and with then the this, the, with yeah, the big yeah. shades and like poofier hair and uh, a cheap suit, and uh, this little kid next to me is like, "Hey, look at you with your little white tie." He's whispering me to, between the shots, you know, and he's like, "You're a fucking sellout, eh?" <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> I was like, inside, I was like, I'm so proud of you, mijo. I'm so <laughs> proud. But so this, this thing, it, it went on for, for years, and it eventually came back. Uh, um, you, um, you forgot to say what you guys, what your main platform was. Though. Oh, yeah. We were militant self-deportationists. Yep. So we vowed to deport ourselves to support Pete Wilson's anti-immigrant <laughs> and a Republican Party's anti-immigration campaign. It was so over so. the top that they didn't, it was genius. They, they yeah, didn't get it. it. They, yeah. they, they ate it up. And, yeah. uh, and, and they eventually uh, came back during the um, Romney. Mitt Romney's uh, presidential campaign where he said, yes, my, they asked him, what's your immigration uh, 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 philosophy? He says, self-deportation. And so I ended up on the Rachel Maddow show yep. explaining, you know, about Daniel Deportado and how we created self-deportation and all of this stuff. 
And it was, uh, it was just a big loop, you know, but we're, we're going on another big crazy loop here. It's, it's time to cut it off. I think yeah. the time's uh, over here. No, I mean, it's just, I, I, when I've read your column, you know, when you used to do the Ask a Mexican, I think some people honestly believe the, your satirical response. So I was like, imagine getting you responding to Daniel Deportado. It was just... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what I would, my response to that. Like, I, dear Mexican, I want to self-deport myself to unite back to Mexico. What do I do? I'm like, here's your Greyhound ticket. Yeah, feel Get free. The hell out of here. <laughs> that would be too short, Sometimes right? It would be as yeah. simple as that, yeah, just yeah, right yeah. to the point. But no, again, talking about a prophecy, Lalo predict. That's how based our politics are now, that they would literally get an idea that was a complete joke 25 years ago and try to pass it off as policy. Yeah, because a month later, Pete Wilson, you know, back in 1994, after our show came out, uh, he, you know, uh, and all our press releases were going out everywhere, he came up with self-deportation as a thing. We were just joking about it. But we, we called it. We, you know, it was like, it was sick, you know, so we're, we're pretty tuned in. So we keep talking about these moments in time, uh, Prop 187. So that, that was an anti-immigration initiative that actually passed in California. Uh, eventually, the courts uh, stripped it of basically anything that it, it could do for, uh, against Latinos. But it was a key moment in time. So let's, let's talk about those momentous occasions. So you have Prop 187 in 1994. You follow that with Prop 209 in mm -hmm. 1996. You follow that with Prop 227, or uh, in yeah, the, two, Prop 209 was uh, the 96. anti affirmative action. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then in, in 1998, you had Prop uh, 227, which did away with bilingual education. So that, those were key moments for California. Then we, it becomes nationalized, right? So 2006, you see the, uh, prior to the, the women's marches, it, uh, the single largest uh, day of marches all over the country. And then you have the election of Donald Trump with a, a lot of the rhetoric tied to immigration. Why these cycles and why the nationalization? Because there's fear of a brown planet. I mean, that's what it boils down to, the fear. And now, and by brown, let's just, expanded as much as possible. Fear of colored people, the United States is going to become majority minority within our lifetimes. California, we're already there. Uh, very few states, I think very few states in the United States are at that point. Hawaii has been like that for a while, New Mexico, New Mexico for sure. and Texas. Is Texas too? Yeah. Okay, yeah, Texas, so it's getting there. Uh, Alabama, I believe, as well. So now it's spreading nationwide. Now diversity is no longer just something uh, bandied around colleges as some sort of aspiration, but it's a reality. And I get it, I actually understand where all of this fear comes from. If people start coming in, moving into your neighborhood or your culture who don't look like you, the human, natural human emotion is to be afraid. My response to that would be is like, do not be afraid of them, ask them. What, like, be curious, like who are you? Like, what, like what's your story? Like, you'd be surprised more often than not. Like I'll give you an example, I do a lot of, re somehow I ended up traveling to the south every year now for, when? Almost a decade at this point. And I started off just because I like bourbon, so I have to go to Kentucky, you know, bourbon trail and all that. Yeah, you guys aren't too far away from that, relatively speaking. But then as a reporter, I started noticing, wow, there's a lot of Mexicans here, which I already knew that, but more Mexicans are coming through these Mexican restaurants. So going through the South, I talk to that, you know, I, I talk about that with my friends back in Southern California, and they have all these uh, stereotypes. Oh, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, bunch of rednecks and hillbillies, Confederates, and this, this, and that. And I, and I tell them the truth. I go to these small towns, I feel perfectly fine because, you know, I'm, I stand, I don't know, I obviously stand out because I'm one of the few Latinos in some of these places, but they treat me as just like any other person uh, from the outside, I guess. Like, I'm sure they have a little bit of skepticism with me, but then once I tell them who I am and what I do, whatever, they're far more welcoming than the people that I find in the cool cities in the South. Like, I've experienced racism in the South. It hasn't been in little, um, what is it, Crossville, Tennessee, or um, uh, what, what's what, Henderson, Kentucky. I'm talking about Nashville. I'm talking about Louisville. It's with the quote unquote hip Southerners. They're far more racist. And, and that, in that case, I would say it's more of a class thing than anything. Mm -hmm. But that's what, that's what really drives us people who are afraid of a country that they no longer remember. So I think it's, part of, it's partly incumbent upon us to show them, yeah, look, that country that you remember, we're still living up to those aspirations, whatever it is. What, hard work, what, uh, apathy to vote, 
what all that stuff, well, obviously this election didn't show it, so we're actually becoming better Americans than the Americans of the past. But why is it okay, you know, fearing something different is one thing, vilification is another. So that's, you that's the American to, way yeah, though. Exactly. Oh, we have vilified anything new. And this is where I always try to do this in my column. I think with Mexicans, again, specifically Mexicans, it's a very special case study. Let me, I'll get to that, but let me back up a little bit. Almost every group that came to this country got vilified. Mm -hmm. and, and especially Mexican Americans in Southern California, they can't believe that at one point, Irish were uh, treated badly, vilified. If you look at the political cartoons, what Thomas Nast used to do, like depicting the Irish as apes, as monkey, Mexicans, we got cockroaches, uh, you know, Nast made them out to be apes and really, really nasty people. Me uh, you know, Nast made uh, Catholics out to be crocodiles trying to eat kids. Mm -hmm. Like some of the vilification of the Irish, and now the Irish are you know, considered to be one of the most American Americans of them all. So all these former quote unquote white groups, at one point they got vilified. The interesting thing with Mexicans, well, the, what, to me one of the most poignant questions I ever got was, my family's been in Texas since the 1700s, None of us speak Spanish. We still have our Latino surname. Yet why is it that a lot of my white neighbors still think of us as wetbacks? And the answer is very simple because the, th the three great groups that the United States has vilified more than anyone have been Native Americans, African Americans, and Mexicans. And out of the Mexicans, we were the big country that they, I mean, they stole all the different Indian territories. With Mexico, they stole half of us, and we've always had these struggles right on the border. It's still, it's, it's all, it's gonna, it's a what, 180, 65-year-old war at this point. So of course there's gonna be vilification. To, to this day, um, you know, General Mattis, Mattis, uh, mm -hmm. Mattis. works for Trump. Yeah. He went and, to the border to tell those poor soldiers, you know, like, uh, you know, you're screwed. But, uh, you know, uh, they're like, what are we doing here? And, and he, he says, well, you know, uh, we don't know <laughs> your mission's to be determined. But then he came out and said, well, you know, like we have to be vigilant because, you know, in 1918, oh, Pancho Villa did a cross-border raid <laughs> and killed Americans. And it's like, dude, are you serious? You know, come on. So that that... Those feelings are still there, and it's irrational. What do you uh, think, Adrian? This is an, I mean, this is a nation founded on white supremacy, racism, nativism, xenophobia. So, I mean, there's a long history of this, right? And in our lifetime, in our lifetime, we literally were born out of different flashpoints in the anti-immigrant mm -hmm. movement, right? In our lifetime, we've seen anti-immigrant politics in this country shift uh, increasingly to the right, right? And we're literally now living through the kind of the apex of that under the current administration, right? But it was Prop 187, uh, 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 you know, the, the 209. Um, my political awakening was more the HR 4437 in 2006 going at the national level. Then I went back to the local level with Arizona's SB 1070. And literally, as I sort of recount this legislative history, I can think of, you know, art articles that you wrote about this. I can think of art pieces that Lalo produced specifically, you know, addressing these flashpoints. But there's a long history of this. And we were literally kind of forged in that, in those, in that struggle at these different flashpoints. So let's talk about uh, the welcome you got to Indiana uh, on your trip here. So uh, as you were driving here yesterday, because oh. we, were, we were talking about, or uh, Gustavo was talking about experience with discrimination or uh, being treated by the way you look, right? Mm -hmm. So just if you can share a little bit about uh, your, your welcome on your drive here. To, yeah, well, not surprisingly, I was pulled over. I uh, had my sort of Midwest racial profiling experience already. <laughs> Um, but what was surprising about that is that what could have, what could have turned into a really kind of uh, nasty experience of racial profiling that we're kind of sort of accustomed to. Uh, of course, out here I was, you know, this is the Midwest. I get pulled over on my drive here from Chicago. Um, and oddly, the officer says, you know, I'm going to have you step out of the vehicle. And I was like, man, it's cold as shit. I don't want to step out of my vehicle. It's like <laughs> snowing and stuff. And then he says, get into my patrol car. Right? And I was like, oh, man, this, can, this can turn ugly real quick. He's like, do you have any weapons? I was like, no, I don't have any weapons. I just, got a, I just went through TSA. You know, I, got no, I got no weapons. On. So what are, you, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm going to Notre Dame. And he says, for what? I'm like, I'm doing a talk. He's like, a talk about what? I was like, immigration politics. And he says, oh, that's well, a hot says, topic. He says, you're a student, right? Yeah, yeah. He, assumed, he asked if I was a student. I was like, no, I'm yeah. not a student. <laughs> I'm, I'm a professor in California, and I'm doing a talk on a book. And he says, you wrote a book? I said, yeah. With words? Yeah. And he says, You speak English? What? 
<laughs> this is where it gets good. He says, well, what's the, what, is it on Amazon? I'm like, yeah, you can pre-order it. <laughs> and he, and he, we're sitting in his patrol car. He pulls out his cell phone. He says, what's the name of it? I tell him. He looks it up, and, and there's Lalo's brilliant cover art, right? And he says, wow, this is so cool. I'm going to order it. <laughs> and then he says, you can go, man. I'll let you go with the warning. Drive safe. Have a good event. And I was like, Lalo, you, you saved go. him yeah, from yeah, a yeah. night in the jail. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> compare that to the experience in Southern California. I mean, we've lived in Orange <laughs> County. We've lived in, you know, in multiple places where you change your behavior based on where you go because of these prior experiences. So uh, I don't know if you can speak to any of that or, you know. In San yeah, Diego. The, oh, man. If, if that same scene happened in Southern California, it would be a Mexican cop who would be an absolute asshole yeah, to yeah. you, sh proving that he could be more no. nasty cop than any white guy. When I was at UCLA, I, I would get routinely pulled over in, in Westwood, either by UCPD, mainly by UCPD, because ma it was mainly around campus. Um, and I could have literally done an experiment on this because <laughs> every single time I was driving a different vehicle, I, I used to help my dad deliver do deliveries. My dad's an upholsterer. So I would sometimes be driving a van or a pickup truck, right? <laughs> and regardless of the vehicle, I'd get pulled over. And it was always the same excuse, right? Oh, you matched the description of a suspect. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> so it's like, I could have I done like a social scientific experiment on you know, racial, I should have been my undergraduate thesis or something. <laughs> How many times I got pulled over at UCLA? Well, uh, when I was a kid, uh, my mom and I used to get um, profiled at the mall, you know? Uh, and uh, for, by the shoplifting police, like, all the time, it was the worst thing. And one time, my mom, uh, she was noticed this like very unsubtle uh, <laughs> shoplifting detective guy was following us around the store, and and so we get. She was like pissed about something. I didn't know. I was like, I don't know. I remember I was like, you know, ten years old or something, or or eleven years old. And uh, we get to. Uh, she started grabbing the clothes. Grabbing some clothes, <laughs> and and then we, I, uh, I'm like, all right, I'm getting some clothes, uh, huh. but uh, like those aren't my size, whatever. So anyway, we get to the the counter, and uh, and that guy is watching us, and she gets and um, she she opens up the purse, and she whips out the rent money, she whips out the rent money, and goes no 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 no, so that guy would see it, and then she goes. In her, in, her, in her terrible English, she's like, these clothes are bad. Ah! And she threw them down, and vamonos, and we walked out. And I was like, what the hell just happened right now? Well, and you didn't get clothes, first of all. I didn't, yeah. get, I didn't get shit that day. <laughs> but that, that, that's the, the, the security the southern, guy yeah, did. Yeah, yeah. Um, so why La Cucaracha? Why La Cucaracha? Um, so my, uh, I had uh, always wanted well, to do Not a, all our audience is bilingual, so. Uh. Yeah, um, uh, you know what La Cucaracha is, right? <laughs> Come on. And uh, so I had always wanted to do a comic strip. Um, I used to, when I was a kid, I used to read, uh, uh, read the comics voraciously. I used to read Mexican comics. I used to read the Sunday comics. And there was this one strip called, when I was a kid, called Gordo. Uh, by Gus Ariola, and it is the, it was the first uh, Latino nationally syndicated comic strip, uh, and it ran for like forty something years, right? Uh, and it was by a Chicano from Tucson, uh, who uh, ended up being an animator for Walt Disney, for Warner Brothers, you name it. Um, and so uh, I, that strip made me realize realized that I could do maybe one day a comic strip, right? And I went to, to high school and college, and I saw uh, Doonesbury and um, uh, Bloom County mm -hmm. uh, comic strips, w which were comic strips with a lot of characters and a lot of politics. It was like, how do those characters react to the headlines of the day? And I was like, I'm going to do that. you know. And eventually, I did get to do that with my comic strip, which is um, sadly. The, you know, there's another comic strip called Baldo, uh, which is more of a family kid strip. But uh, those from Gordo to Baldo and my Baldo came out a month before mine uh, officially, although I was already doing comics with those characters. But as far as National Syndicate, and, and so that makes uh, mine, uh, by missing by a month, I could have been, sadly, the second. Uh, com nationally syndicated comic strip by a Latino in the U.S. 
But you know, being in the top three is pretty good. But it's also very sad because that came out in 2004. You know, um, but the title of the strip, uh, I had always, I had done strips, uh, a, a strip before in the LA Weekly called LA Cucaracha. And just because one day this character appeared to me in my sketchbook, and he was like a Chicano hipster kind of cholo street poet cockroach character. He was like a, a, a you know, and um, what's the word, you know, like a human like uh, the manifest. Animal. No. Um, Anthropomorphized. Anthropomorphic or whatever cucaracha person. <laughs> uh, and because of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the long history of the, of the song La Cucaracha, which was, uh, I didn't really realize until later, was a political satire song that people would sing. Mm -hmm. uh, like it goes, yeah, it has uh, roots back to Spain, that mm -hmm. people would sing this song and make fun of the local lord or whoever and, and just change the lyrics, you know? And, I, and so, um, but I didn't even know that. I just okay. knew really that um, it, it, the, the Oscar Zeta Costa, uh, the, the, um, the brown buffalo, had written a book, you know, The Revolt of the Cockroach People. And uh, so that, that image has always been like a, a, an image of, of defiance against like being called cucarachas. was like, yeah, we multiply, you know, we're all over. We're going to outlast everybody. So, uh, so the month before my comic strip came out, uh, nationally syndicated, there was some idiot in Arizona campaigning against my comic strip coming out. And he, would, he was a, a Latino. And he was calling newspapers, telling them, this, cockroach, this, this, this comic strip represents us as cockroaches. Like, again, a person who is literal and could not get satire huh. uh, or humor at all. And uh, the re I had resistance before the strip even came out. So I go, this is a good sign. So. <laughs> uh, you both share a common uh, critic and uh, these, these hate letters, right? Because uh, I, I read both your stuff. Like, uh, who is this woman that? Uh, oh, Dirty Diane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, uh, I like to publish my, my hate mail yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. You know, I'll change, I'll, I'll take the names out. Um, uh, or take the email address out, because it's always email now. Yeah. Um, and then I'll run the letter and let everyone tear into the letter and, and laugh at it. I have this racist high school, retired high school history teacher, Larry, Larry Crawford. And he used to teach out in, uh, in, in Riverside. Wow. And he retired because there was too many brown kids mm -hmm. coming to his school. And now he is like a full-blown Trump idiot that writes me, like almost every other day, he sends me like stuff from Fox News or like you know some some undocumented immigrant did a crime. So you know. But you I just remember when you started your column, sure. all of a sudden she started writing you. So yeah, yeah. Now yeah. you share responsibility for Diane. Right? So <laughs> Diane was this woman who uh, started. Uh, uh, sh she eventually. Um, I, who? You didn't see her. I saw her. Like she. She was like write a me. lawyer. She no. She is a. Um, she. She has a business, doesn't she? She wrote me a, a na nasty email and then said, I am a Fortune 500 okay. CEO. And, you know, and Trump is like the most brilliant man and blah, blah, blah. And you are, and, and she would use like really off like KKK level, mm -hmm. nasty, nasty language. Um, and, and so I, I think I published her letter and then people started like, Give us more info. We want to find out where she where where is she a CEO? Yeah. And she ended up being a um, um, there she is right now calling in. <laughs> and, and she ended up she's a um, she has like a medical uh, testimony like legal mm. medical testimony business in Lawndale, California, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you know that she employs people of color and immigrants in this thing or interfaces with like medical. And I, I still don't want to drop the bomb on her, but. Uh, one of these days when I'm really bored and pissed, I'm going to like ruin her business. But she's <laughs> then, when Gustavo came onto LA Times, she, she had started to collect the email addresses of all the, every LA Times person, and I think even the delivery guys, and sending us her hateful, hateful, right wing, scary editorials. Because she, she would CC all of us, right? And then pretty soon we started like laughing at Diane, Diane Sagerian. Is her name? Yeah, yeah. I think she's yeah, like yeah. an Armenian lady. She's mm -hmm. like insane. But yeah. she, she, she really. 
Um, she started going after Gustavo. Anytime you would publish something, anytime they publish anything slightly pro-immigrant, oh my God, her head would explode. Yeah. But it, I think it's, it's funny to like kind of expose it to the light and just show everybody like, you know, I, I do it because I want everybody to know like, this is what I do every day. I get this crap. You know, my favorite hate letter I ever got uh, said, go back to Africa. You know, <laughs> that, that guy was pissed, <laughs> all right? And so as far, I don't know how you feel as a writer, but I know that as a, as a cartoonist and maker of images, uh, like I, I judge from reading these hate letters that uh, cartoons are super effective in getting under people's skin because like, unless you're writing me a, a better cartoon and, and attacking me in a cartoon, it's like I'm inside your brain forever. Yeah. Like there, oh, yeah. I'm in your head and you'll never get me out. And you can write me all the hateful stuff in the world. You can even come and you know, try to kill me. But I still win every time. I, I always <laughs> tell people, if you really don't like me, don't tell me that. I don't care if, as, as a good writer, you don't care if people like you or hate you as long as they read you. Yeah. Frankly, if they hate you, yeah, you get that little sense of satisfaction. Like, I'm in your mind. I'm in your mind. I am in your mind, and I'm not going to go away. Like for instance, I left the OC Weekly last year. Uh, the paper that was the only paper I ever had. That was my only next question: is if you could tell us about the transition. Sure. So I, I, you know, I was at the OC Weekly. It was the only job I ever had as an adult. I left. <laughs> last, I was editor in chief for almost six years. I left last year because the owner wanted me to lay off half the staff, and I refused. And so I ended up having. It was my dream job. I never wanted to do anything else other than cover the place where I was born and raised, you know, turn it into a better place, into a be place where I would have liked to have grown up. And so in this past year, all I've done is just freelance, freelance for anyone who'll have me, Time Magazine, NPR, The New Yorker, big, you know, big publication. And I don't say that to brag so much as that if you lose your dream job, well, I had every right to just frankly drink myself to death. It was that traumatic of experience for me. But I'm like, I got stories to tell. I got stories to tell, and I'm going to go tell them. And it was funny, because just for, as a mental note, a lot, of pe a lot of outpouring of support came out for my decision. And my haters had a field day. They had entire, they would write entire essays about, <laughs> uh, so I knew they were doing that, but I'm like, I'm not going to read them. I'm not going to read them until I'm in a better mental space. So I finally got to that place about nine months ago. And not, not nine months ago, about three months ago. Just because at that point you got over it and you're like, ah. And then one day I'm like, you know what? I'm, like, I'm, I'm not doing anything else. I'm, I'm at home. I'm just, you know, getting ready. Like, let me check these things out. And it was amazing. They were saying, oh, you know, Gustavo's so horrible that his wife has already left them because on Facebook we have marital status uncertain. We just have it like that. Like, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> you know, Gustavo's never going to have another job again. Gustavo this, like, I was just like, and then, I, because people tell me, oh, they're still talking about you. Even though I'm not writing about them anymore, they're still talking about me. I, I'm different from Lalo and that. Lalo gets a lot of hate mail, but I have a unique ability to unite the far left Latinos and neo-Nazi white supremacists <laughs> united in their hatred of me for completely different reasons, but still, they both despise me. And you know, with the neo-Nazis, their particular hatred of me is that um, I send them to jail. I don't know if you folks saw that uh, documentary that Frontline had about Charlottesville, or that if you heard that how there were white supremacists arrested for inciting riots in Charlottesville and Berkeley and all over Southern California. ProPublica, uh, the amazing writer A.C. Thompson, he's the one who did the final legwork to get them there. But it was our paper at the OC Weekly. We're the ones who exposed them. I've been fighting, like, honest and good. We're talking about fighting white supremacy. I've been fighting white supremacists for 16 years at the OC Weekly. I've put white supremacists in jail. I've been doxxed. I've, been, I've had death threats against my family. I, you know, I, I go there. So when it comes to the, uh, any sort of haters or whatever, I'm like, you're nothing. Have, have, you, have you given me a death threat? Have you given me a death threat where I, I had to go around with like a, a knife in my hand the whole time? Or I was recently at a panel where we had documentary hate. I literally got my former intern who's like 6'1", 300 pounds. He's like, oh, I'm going to bring my bigger cousin. He was 6'7", <laughs> 400 pounds. These two Chicanos, like from the Valley actually, mm -hmm. and they literally followed me around the whole time. And the whole time I had my keys, like brass knuckles, just in case someone... <laughs> We laugh, but it's true. It's absolutely true. But that said, so when I get stuff, people on Twitter, oh, you know, you're anti this, anti that. I'm like, 
whatever. You're the, you're the one who's thinking about me. I'm not thinking about you at all. I got stories to do. I got white supremacists who actually put into jail while you're uh, you know, yakking around thinking you're so woke that you're not doing anything at all. <laughs> Tell me about your experience. Uh, we, we talked about your, you, you went to Florida, but the immigration experience in Northern California mm -hmm. and the detachment uh, from certain kind of activism, you know, mm -hmm. how did that impact you know, how, how you saw the Latino community? Yeah, well, I mean, I, we mentioned earlier how, you know, all these locations have kind of their own sort of racial history. Um, my experience in, in Northern California, I was teaching at UC Santa Cruz, but living in the Bay Area, in San Jose in particular, uh, long-standing Mexican community uh, on the east side of, of San Jose, also Asian community, Vietnamese community mm -hmm. in San Jose. Um, so deep, deep migration histories there. Um, and, you know, it, it also was a very valuable lesson for me. I was able to plug into all immigrant rights organizing and activism in, in Northern California, different organizations. Uh, Siren is one of the um, organizations uh, in San Jose. Uh, in Santa Cruz, I was also doing some of this uh, community political education work uh, with uh, migrant communities. And frankly, the, the bulk of the book really kind of materialized there in that setting, in that context, sort of engaging in this exercise of working alongside these communities, with learning from these communities. And that experience is what allowed me to kind of revisit this project and kind of re-narrativize it the way I really wanted it to. So uh, it was yet another example of how you know, my own sort of migration, if you will, um, expanded my understanding and expanded kind of my experience of working with these But we talked about 2006 as a flashpoint, and if you really look at it, relative to their population, they were not very active in the marches. So it's a different kind of activism, right? San Jose? Yeah, San That's Jose. I mean, San like, Jose had a very large. They had a large, but it, like compared to their actual number of Latinos, number of immigrants in general, it was dwarfed by what happened in Southern California. It was dwarfed by Dallas. It was dwarfed by Chicago proportionally. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's a misconception. I mean, I remember having a, a debate with a colleague of mine that, you know, Prior to 2006, there wasn't much activism happening in San Jose or the Bay Area. I mean, that's, that, that flies in the face of generations of activists all mm -hmm. over the Bay Area who are doing immigrant and rights work. And, yeah. and even you know, cross-racial organizing, Oakland, San Jose. So, so there's a long history of activism there. Sure, it takes on different forms. It looks somewhat differently. Um, but you know, uh, how many people turned out to the march isn't necessarily the best way to understand it. I think there's a lot happening on the ground. Um, uh, towards social movement building and social justice activism. Well, you speak of San Jose, and you were actually in San Jose uh, soon after Trump got elected, uh, so in 2007, mm -hmm. and Fox was covering the uh, a protest that you uh, participated yeah. in, yeah. Uh, in in San Jose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's these conceptions and these narratives that they have about who these activists are, right? So the yeah. assumption was, Oh, let's talk to one of these. You know, in fact, some of the commentary that they were saying was, "Oh, yeah, they're they're probably just going to use a bunch of curse words and they're going to yell at us." And so Sean Hannity uh, has the uh, the actual person with the microphone. It's like, P pick one of them out. It's like we just warn our viewer viewers that they might use foul language. No. Uh, so you know, they look around and you have your 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 hat, your Mexican hat, and like they go, it's like, and. Unbe unbeknownst to them, you know, they're talking to Latino. <laughs> they picked on the wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. So tell us about, you know, just what was going well, through the, your head. That, that's a great example of that. So, so this was, you know, then candidate Trump on the, on the campaign trail. He makes a stop in San Jose. And of course, there's uh, an anti-Trump protest. We closed down the streets in downtown San Jose outside of the venue where he was speaking. And, you know, just anecdotally, you know, it was, it was you know, a wide array of folks there. It wasn't yeah. just Latino, no, 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 it was African American, yeah. Latino you know, white liberals, et cetera. You know, it was, it was a constellation of folks. Um, and also a bunch of Trump sympathizers who were there documenting this stuff, right? So there I was, wearing my sombrero um, with my sign. I remember getting a lot of attention, um, getting photographed a whole lot. Um, but what I didn't expect was to be sort of randomly approached by a reporter and a cameraman, right? And I, now, from my perspective, you know, they, there was no news logo, logo. There was no way for me to identify which news source this was. I frankly thought it was probably some right wing, you know, fringe thing. And I was like, Fox News. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, uh, little did I know that this was a live, uh, live transmission with Sean Hannity feeding the questions to this reporter, right, who approaches me. 
Um, and I was there, kind of, should I, should I give this guy, grant this guy an interview or not? And I said, sure, fine, whatever. Um, and he begins with these series of questions, and I just start breaking it down, right? I mean, clearly, you know, they, they weren't expecting that. Um, so thankfully, someone who was watching this live transmission, you know, recorded that segment and posted it on YouTube, and it's got over 100,000 views now. This thing yeah. went viral, <laughs> uh, and, you know, they didn't know that I was, you know, a PhD professor. They didn't know that a from... Mexican could be smart back then. Exactly. That's what it yeah. boiled down to. So right? the response was, was like, yeah, move along, next, next. Yeah, you know, it gets to the point where Sean Hannity just completely gives up and says, yeah. next person, next, next person. person. Yeah, yeah. You know, move on. Sean Hannity's like, like, me no speak English. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a great teaching moment. I use yeah. it in some of the classes and you know, because it brings together right all these contradictions, right? Yeah. The role of the media, I, how this yeah. is framed, et cetera. So. I have other questions, but I actually want to have you engage with our students and our uh, uh, people from the community that are yeah, here, right. so um, we will turn it over to you guys. They go up to the uh, mic right there. Yeah, yeah. there's a mic, yeah. Yeah, so if you guys could just go up to the mic right there, don't be shy. Come one, come all. We have time for a few questions, I think. It's six, uh, Yeah, we have 15 minutes, so. Yeah, um, less than that. Sin vergüenza. Questions, comments. I'll be, I'll be right back. See the students back there. Lalo's leaving. He'll be back, he'll be back. I'll take questions in the men's room. <laughs> <laughs> just do, don't, don't do what Homer did that one time. Huh? It's a okay. Simpsons joke. Questions? Comments? Comments? Yeah, you can get up. You can get up. Don't be shy. <laughs> You're still thinking of a question. Hmm. Come on, professors. You always save the day, so one of you have to ask something. Here we go. We have one person. One of my students. As a start. All right. It's we can off. still hear you. Can no, he, there you oh, go. Okay. There you go. Thanks so much for coming. Um, just you guys have kind of touched on this, but I was actually on a talk yesterday about the midterm elections and how racism, sexism, all of it together is just at its core against the change of the status quo. Mm -hmm. And that the originally at the root of all of this. Mm -hmm. But as you said, as we've seen the changing demographics in our country, how do we change the narrative to like an acceptance of that new status quo? And how do we take away the negative politics and address the changes in like a positive manner? I if think that makes you, sense. Yeah, no, I think to change all of this, we have to take power. You have to, young people, you need to get involved into the electoral process, and that's something that you've definitely seen in 2016 and 2018. You're seeing it with this new face of Congress. What? Two Muslim women are now in Congress. You have Ale Alexandria Ocasio from, you know, mm -hmm. youngest woman in Congress. You have uh, first Native American women, two of them as well. I forget, one's from New Mexico, I think the other one's from is Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Kansas, Kansas, yeah, it's Kansas as well, I, I think. So you just have to get involved. And once you, ha once you start taking those reins of powers, that's how you start helping to change the power structure and the dynamics. You cannot, I do not believe in, or the, I, I think you, everyone gets to the, everyone can have their way of their action. Some of it is slower. The yeah. one that gets all the attention is the fast one. I think the fast ones, whether it's the sit-ins, whatever it has, that's powerful, that's important, that's righteous. But also don't, uh, don't dismiss the people who are working behind the scenes yeah. to really get that effective change. In that sense, it's interesting because my, myself as a reporter, I do things immediate, fast. I could print something now, right now. Lalo, he could also sketch stuff out. Professors take far longer because they lecture, they do their <laughs> books. But in some ways, they're the ones who are teaching all these ideas that percolate to your generation that you then take on. Like we talk about this coaching tree, you know, uh, the, uh, he was, he's, his mentor, his mentors are in here in the audience. Oh, and you have like this legacy of people really trying to dismantle all that stuff. And I think the, also the most important thing is you can't give up hope. Even at the darkest moments, you cannot give up hope. Humanity has been in far worse situations and those people had far worse situations far worse situations that you may be right now, they did not give up hope. And then at the end, I really do believe good wins. We're at a Catholic university. You know, you, you know the good book. You know, how it, you know how that ends, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just get a little, yeah. a little closer yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you got to turn it on. It's or we could hear you from here. Yeah. So, okay, so yeah, essentially, there you go. My question is, so I have, uh, I'm sure we all have, like, family. You guys all have family. That's a statement. Um, you guys all have family who you probably have political disagreements with. Um, what would you say to someone who is 
a far right Hispanic person that's in your family, right? You guys see the struggle, and I guess, how would you come at that from a comedic perspective? Like, how do you take that lightly? And how do you come at it from like a personal perspective? And how would you come at that from an educated academic perspective, I guess? Yeah, some of my favorite conversations uh, in class with my students, so, you know, primarily first generation Latino working class students, is, is when they take back the, this, the material that we're talking about in class and share it with their family, with their parents, right? <laughs> uh, and the kind of ideological contrast that that generates, right? You can imagine these kids going back and talking, giving a very different rendition of Mexican political history, for example, to their parents. Um, and I think, you know, it starts with that consciousness, right? It starts with that uh, different perspective on what, what narratives we hear from, what sort of dominant hegemonic narratives we hear from the media or even through educational institutions and challenging those narratives and, cha and ch challenging um, those uh, stereotypes, those inaccurate renditions of history, whatever debate we're talking about, whether it's immigration. Uh, and you know, slowly but surely, you know, I, I, oftentimes that's a very difficult conversation to have, but even within my own family, I can sort of slowly chipped away at sort of deeply housed stereotypes, mm -hmm. uh, homophobic views in the Latino community, anti-black racism in the Latino community, right? With this kind of, you know, political consciousness that kind of con confronts and contests those longstanding uh, ideologies in our community. I don't believe ostracization works at all. I think you should always be open to the fact, I, I was on this panel, uh, again, we, uh, at my alma mater, Chapman University in Orange, and we had screened a Charlottesville documentary from Frontline, and we had a, a political science professor who did a book uh, profiling white supremacists, why they, you know, why, it's one thing to have the beliefs, another thing to join neo-Nazi gangs and all that, and commit crimes, and then it's quite another thing to get out of that lifestyle. And so this is a man with experience where he has, he still talks to ne former neo-Nazis who now go around the country and saying, this is my past, this is why we should break down white supremacy. And he said, you should always be open to the possibility that people can change. How do you change people? That's all gonna be different perspectives. Some of it is through just straight facts, just you give them the facts, oh, okay, that makes sense. Some of it is just through examples, some of it is just through love. But as long as you have, as long as you think, let's put it this way, you shouldn't, again, you should not give up hope that people's minds can change. Because if you do, if you close off, ostracizing, I just don't believe in that. It's one thing, it's one thing to have beliefs, it's another thing to act on them. I think when you act on those beliefs, that's a little bit different. But when, you're, when you have those beliefs, there is that possibility that you can change those beliefs. Uh, can I say something? Um, I remembered uh, to turn off my mic when I went to the restroom. Good. <laughs> No, uh, what I wanted to say was, um, I was very proud of myself, uh, but uh, my, my daughter, uh, okay, so uh, my daughter does ballet, my youngest daughter, she's 14. Uh, one of her friends, I'm uh, friends with her dad, who's a Chicano rock band guy, and we're dance dads, and we ha hang out at this ballet dance studio, sometimes see each other. Uh, he was in uh, Skinze Letras. Oh, no way. That's an awesome old, old school Chicano ska band. And mm. uh, so he, he, he sent me a photo. I wish I could project it right now. From He says, uh, my daughter went uh, to a birthday party. And, um, and these are all Mexican-American people. So my daughter went to a birthday party. And here's a picture of a cake that they had. This is last weekend. Nazi flag. <laughs> cake with a swast red with a swastika white circle and SS on the side and I was like no mames man what are you what is this and he's like they are he says my daughter was uh, shocked and took a photo and sent it to me because they're they're uh, they're very indigenous looking Mexican American family they're pro Nazi they, they talked to her about how Adolf Hitler did lots of great things and they and then some other things about how they compared it. I, I don't even understand what this means. They compared it, his genocide, to the Catholic Church genocide. And I think they, en they enjoyed the genocide by, <laughs> by the Catholic Church on indigenous people. And I was like, oh my god, what, what, what kind of a hole are we, have we slid into? This is amazing. But you can Google, you can find Latino Nazis all day long on Google. And they're, they're in every country. Oh. They're, they're in the US. And I don't get it. 
you know, and that's just the, I mean, you cannot only hack at so much, hack away at so much ignorance. Some of those people, I mean, I don't know what happened to them that they think that that's okay, but I think, you know, kind of like we failed them and society's failing a lot of these people and we have to go back to, you know, punching Nazis. Is <laughs> <laughs> that's what he Question. said. <laughs> I wondered which medium you find to be your favorite and sort of what freedoms that medium allows you, um, specifically with sort of political arguments versus like artistic um, You know, I, I, I love drawing, but God, do I love Twitter. Because <laughs> I could just, I could work out jokes and, and ideas and uh, see what, what, you know, try stuff out. Like many stand-up comics do, they get on Twitter try out and stuff. Sometimes it goes very bad. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but um, I just love writing gags, you know? I think there's nothing more pure. An, a visual artist friend of mine, uh, I think, said online one day, like, wow, you know, it's, uh, it, it must feel good to be a visual artist, but to know that musicians are on a level above you, because with music, you can touch someone's soul you know, such a way that art almost, visual art almost can't. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Man, that's, uh, <laughs> I gotta learn an instrument. Yeah. yeah. Adrian. Well, I'm not artistically inclined uh, at all, uh, but I, the one sort of medium that I have sort of participated with uh, uh, in collaboration with these gentlemen is both of them uh, at one point, and Lalo still to this day has a, uh, a community-based radio program, KPFK, ethnic media, community-based media is another important space. I was at K KPFK when Gustavo had a show there uh, doing an interview on Latinos in the South. It was after I had returned from the University of Florida. Um, but that's probably the extent of my, of my uh, no, no artistic ability here. So no, but you, you know, you're a professor, and obviously academia is your voice. Yeah. And you find power in telling these stories, everything that we've talked about through an academic voice. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you know, academics, you know, we from time to time look for sort of more public dissemination of our work and so forth, so there's also that angle. Yeah, there, everyone has, again, everyone has their chip into the game. I cannot draw worth a damn. I love music, but I cannot play an instrument worth a damn. The only thing I could do is write and speak very loudly, and so that's what I do. <laughs> One more question. One more question. And then after that, we'll be outside, we'll talk to you folks, all that good stuff. Uh, flip it again. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, thank you. Um, I apologize if you can't understand me. I'm a little sick. But um, thank you so much for being here. You really inspired me a lot listening. Um, so I, like to preface, I write a lot of um, music and poetry, um, spoken word poetry, about the um, Syrian American, um, about Syrian American like activism. Um, and so when people sometimes like share my work on social media, they they say this Arab American poet, Rene Yassin. And so I want to ask you, how do you feel? What are the pros and cons of maybe being labeled as like a Latino artist or a Latino writer versus just being labeled as a writer or an artist? Very good, excellent, excellent question. question. Yeah, uh, I, I'm a Chicano artist uh, through and through. I don't care uh, what you call me, but mm -hmm. I'm a Chicano <laughs> artist. I don't care if people don't think that cartoons are art. I think my cartoons are like on a different level. And <laughs> I, I, you know, people borrow my concepts all the time. They do it to Gustavo. They do it to any, any, anybody that sticks their neck out and, uh, and, and puts their stuff out there. I mean, I think they're, they're great people. And, and I think that's the great, a great gift is to, you know, inspire other people whichever way. Um, so, but I, I'm firmly grounded uh, in the fact that I, I, I'm a Chicano artist. My art is, is just like the traditional Chicano art. It's political, it uses imagery from my culture, uh, and it tries to be positive and uplifting and, uh, and also hard hitting. So that's that, that's my, that's yeah, my. Yeah, you're getting, you're getting at the heart of this question of, of the, the contradictions of pan-ethnicity, right, which we talked about earlier. Uh, and another one of the reasons why I kind of 
recruited these, you know, Lalo and Gustavo to kind of leave their imprint on this project of mine was because we also kind of represent different sort of shades of that, mm -hmm. of that identity, right? Lalo, as you just mentioned, he is a Chicano artist. I actually don't identify as Chicano. I identify as Zacatecano primarily, mm -hmm. right? We are born of a different generation, and I think the, the politics of ethnicity shifted. Uh, early, growing up in early 1990s Los Angeles, you know, our feuds at school wasn't about, you know, Chicano this or Chicano that. It was what state in Mexico you were from, what state was better. So, you know, that doesn't mean I can't identify with the Chicano struggle, the Chicano movement, or even Latino identity, uh, but it, it adds another layer to that, you know, to those sets of identity, those flexible identities. Yeah, and for me, my identity was always Orange County. It wasn't even Mexican. Well, the name I eventually gave myself was a Naranjero. Like an orange, it mean, literally means an orange picker, but for me, it would be the definition of an orange county. And so for me, that told me everything I had to say. My family's roots, one way or another, go back there a century. I was born and raised there, and I worked there, and I lived there, and I hope to die there as well. That was always my life's work. And that it happened to be a Mexican doing that, yeah, that was very much part of my identity. But of course, that didn't mean that's all I ever covered. So like, I covered hate groups. I was the food critic, not just about Mexican food, but I covered all food in Orange County. For 17 years, I ended up doing 1,000 restaurant reviews. Syrian food's magnificent. Oh my God, we have a lot of we have a lot of Syrians in Orange County. Um, so I knew I know what's like all the different like what 15 different types of kebe or whatever. It's like amazing, amazing stuff. And so then people would be surprised, like, oh wow, you could write about Vietnamese food. I'm like, yeah, like, and not because oh, because I'm a Mexican, but I'm a Mexican in Orange County. This is my worldview. And also as a just as a writer, I'm curious about the world. So the the, the best example I always give is like. I also, I still write a column for a journal called Gravy. It's the journal of the Southern Foodways Alliance. It's great uh, nonprofit based out of the University of Mississippi. I always describe them as they, they're trying to solve, they're trying to solve the, call, the problem of the South through food, through foodways. And so I write, a, I'm their regular columnist. So what the hell is a Mexican kid from Orange County doing a column about the South? Everything he's supposed to. That's exactly who I am. Fantastic. It's best to surprise people. Sometimes. Yes. So Thank you. I want one. I want you guys to maybe answer one last question: Where we began. You uh, you say that a lot of your work is sort of a prophecy. Can you give us a your the prophecy from today that will oh. live on? <laughs> it does not work like that. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> if you had to, you, you you know from from I don't want to steal your Orange County thunder, but I knew. Back when uh, Pete Wilson was doing all this anti-immigrant stuff, that it was gonna end, it was gonna like lead to. You don't have to be a genius to figure out it's gonna lead to the end of Republicans in California, and here we are. The Republicans are getting chased out of California, uh, and it, so uh, I'll, I'll 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 say I'll, you know in the future. Uh, this kind of hate and anti-immigrant sen sentiment is going to at least go away for a while because uh, the trends are not looking good for Republicans. Obviously, this is why the anti-immigrant thing, they're fighting us, and it's ineffective. And there's going to be lots more of that, and, and, and they're, they're going to vanish. I already drew that cartoon a long time ago <laughs> with GOP dinosaurs and a big asteroid labeled demographic change coming. <laughs> And so, uh, it's, it, like I said, it doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. Yeah, uh, things will get better. Things will get better. Even at the darkest points, you always have to believe things will get better. And you should rest go on with life knowing that things will be better. However, if you don't do anything about it, then things will not get better faster than you want it to. In other words, you all have, I, I've said this, I think, four times already. I'll say it again. You all have your chip throw it into the game. It's all a different chip for all of you, but the important thing is for you to throw it in and play it. Yeah, we don't want to see any Thank more Nazi, Nazi birthday cakes. Yeah, no more. We, we, uh, a small token of our appreciation. We have uh, some small gifts for you. Thank um, you. All right, thank you. And I want to take this time to thank all of the students. I know you guys are a bit stressed. It's the end of the semester for coming. A Rolex for, watch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the community members who, who also came to join us, uh, I think it's a, you were Thank here you. to witness a very special moment and, you know, what I want, what I envisioned with the Ivory Tower meets uh, longtime uh, 
Chicano activists in, in your own uh, respective fields. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it and I, uh, join me in thanking. Thank you. Her Thank you so us. much. Thank you for spending your time with us. And also a big hand for Professor Ramirez for putting together this excellent panel.